the okay okay so we're live now okay and we're here, we're here with Kathy Schrock and I'm not even sure how to introduce Kathy Schrock Kathy we've known each other for lots of years 20 years yeah mm -hmm. probably 20 years and Kathy has been a librarian and a technology coordinator and um, a teacher and uh, a pioneer, um, probably one of the first people to create a resource on the web um, that everybody flocked to because it was, um, it, I don't know how to describe that. Organized. Organized. <laughs> <laughs> Librarian-like. So, uh, yeah, so you've been a pioneer in, in as technology has evolved in, in how to thoughtfully use um, uh, resources, both hard hardware and software resources for learning. Um, I rely on your wisdom uh, and and the way you organize things, and and uh, I, I use Kathy's materials all the time. And so we are now joined by Loren and and Beth, and we're here with Kathy, everybody, and um, there'll be probably be a few other folks joining us. And so Kathy, what did I leave out? And Kathy's son just got engaged, and her husband's hiking. The Pacific Crest Trail. Crest. <laughs> I keep wanting to say coast, but Crest. Uh, and we've, we've, we've actually kind of had interesting exchanges at conferences. Yeah, we, uh, when the Nook first came out, um, we were at a conference and we went to Barnes & Noble and all they had was a cardboard version. And <laughs> the woman they had teaching it or talking about it was from the music department. So Joyce and I kind of knew more than she did. But, right. When um, she was alive, she wasn't cardboard. <laughs> right, she wasn't cardboard, but the nooks were cardboard. And so she, uh, so Joyce wanted to do something for her blog, so we actually did a video, but the poor woman, we, she got hammered by the, our questions. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't do very much demonstrating on that cardboard nook. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, we, we do, we do uh, interesting things together. We do have a, uh, a, a presentation together that we've never done. As um, I can tell them how, who, yeah, we're Lucy and Ethel. Guess who's who, and um, so we. I have that all actually still all archived and ready to go. So. I have the apron. I was yeah. really ready for that. <laughs> I know. So we do have a, a joint presentation to, at some point. We're going to do. So. Mm -hmm. And we've we'll heckled a few other speakers. We heckle a lot. Yeah, only to each other, not really out loud. But yeah, we're kind. Sort of. We're kind. Yeah. Oh no, no. Actually, one time we weren't kind. Where were we? New Jersey. Yeah. Right. We weren't kind there. I remember. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. but most of the time we're kind. We're kind. But, but I do want the class to think that I'm largely kind. But we're crazy when we're together. So. <laughs> so anyway, Joyce dances much better than I do. Um. So I'm, go I'm going to Texas this week, and I'm going to two step. Oh. Oh. This week? Are you going for ISTE or no? I'm going for ST two, but I'm going to Billy okay. uh, to Billy Bob's in Fort Worth. Oh well, we got we got uh, well, I we got I have boots now. We got them in Nashville, a bunch of us. Good. So, so um, I'm gonna wear them the whole time I'm in San Antonio. So I'm so psyched. Okay. So uh, what else? I, the one thing I have done over the years before I retired in June of eleven from tech director job, I every year I study something in depth. And then the next year I present about it. So I do all kinds of different things based on what I think or I project will be useful for teaching and learning. So that, that's why when you look at the things I do, you're like, what? How does that go with that? How does she know about that? So like I said, I study something in depth. Now that I'm presenting all the time, pretty much studying everything all the time in depth, and it's a little overwhelming, um, it's harder now to 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 do stuff because I'm constantly pumping out things, but I do have a lot more time to learn. So I'm becoming much smarter um, in broader areas than I was before, but I'm not quite as deep. But that's what happens when you have to... What is the present. topic of this year? Well, the, to well, the, well, the topic that I'm working on right now studying is uh, digital workflow. So I think that's going to be really important um, as things get totally digital and how to handle it. So that's what I'm working on pretty much now. The presentations I'm working on now, I'm doing um, higher order thinking skills and blooms. And what I did with this one, I'm still working on. I have one more thing to go. Rather than just talk about it like for an iPad conference, rather than just talk about the apps, I actually used the free hugs video and then actually cr created the exemplars or I was the student. 
So I gave myself assignments at each level of blooms and I did about 10 or 12 products. And then I took just each one a different app. Then I took explain everything and used that one app to do um, a Yeats, Yeats poem but one at each level of blooms using that app. So I've been doing a lot of products. I think that's much more useful than talking about the app because the apps are so easy to use, but people don't often see products with the apps. They're very hard to find. So that's what I've been doing now. So I've been constantly <laughs> constantly making things. And it's um, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. So Great. Yep. Okay, so I know Kathy wanted to share some screenshots with us. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is um, one of the... It, you guys already did infographics um, and critically evaluated them. So don't critically evaluate these. These are results from a, a workshop, some of them, most of them. Some of them are ones that are out there. But this is a, a library teacher workshop on how to create infographics, but the one part of the presentation that isn't in my regular infographics presentation is advocacy and promotion using infographics. So I just want to show you some slides and talk you through some of the stuff, and you can see some of the products that people put out in a three hour period. All right, so let me share my screen. Okay. There you go. Oh, you, are you seeing it? And now are you seeing the presentation? You seeing the presentation, Joyce? If I talk, my screen's going to show. So I'm going to be quiet for a while, but I, when I'm quiet, I see it. Okay. All right. So there's many ways to use infographics yourself for advocacy and promotion. You've already looked at and evaluated, critically evaluated um, infographics. So Susan Yutsky of Ohio Elementary Library Media Association gave me some prompting to think about including ways infographics can be used to support advocacy efforts for teacher librarians and their programs. Movements.org suggests some tips on how to use infographics for advocacy. Think about representing a statistic in a visually or an emotionally striking way. This increases the chance of you engaging a wider base of potential supporters. Put yourself in the role of the audience. Think about their point of view think about what they already know about the issue, don't re rehash what you know that they already know, and think about the context in which they'll view your infographic, then come up with the attributes of the typical viewer and then create the infographic for that typical viewer. Think about where you're going to get the data. Will you be creating surveys and gathering data yourself? Will it be published research data by respected organizations? Again, what does your typical viewer expect? and then create the infographic. So in some of the workshops, I gave people some um, iPad data, survey data, about iPads in schools, and they were advocating for them in their school or district. So here are some samples. So the one on the left-hand side, 96,000 missing iPads in that particular school district in Texas. They had 96,000 students. And after they looked at all the data, they realized that they had none. And so that was theirs. The one on the right um, was done only with an iPad in an app called Visualize. And they, they were from Derby School, this particular group of people. So they made this only using the iPad and moving things back and forth among the iPads using various um, solutions. So they had a huge learning curve, but they did a pretty good job. Kathy? Yep. I, I, I recently did a presentation with um, um, Hangouts. Uh, your slides are not moving forward. Okay. So um, if you can use the navigation on the, um, you're in the slide making area, but um, either hit the down arrow or, um, or really click on the, the next one because it doesn't work from slide uh, show format. It only works from, um, you know, the slide creation area. Okay, so, so you're seeing, you're so still seeing you're still seeing advocacy and promotion, the that's first slide? Right. That's right. So if you click on the number of the slides you want to show on the left in, in that little I uh, see. map bar, yeah, that's it. Now, now we're moving on. Okay, good. All right, so you're seeing it now? We see advocacy with bullet points. Let me just... Um... 
Okay, so you see that. All right. And these were here were the 96,000 missing iPads in NISD. And the one on the right was done um, was done on Visualize, which is an iPad app. All right. And the thing about that particular one is you can layer images, which is you can't do in every iPad app. That's why they used it. So they sent out before I came to Ohio. Are you seeing me also? You seeing me? No, you're just seeing the slides. Okay. They in when I I didn't know if I had to look at the camera. <laughs> they um they sent out a survey ahead of time about certified librarians in Ohio elementary schools to every elementary school in Ohio, and they didn't get obviously information from everybody, but they got a huge amount of data. So this was an infographic. All right. So this was 76 responded, serving 126,000 students in 289 buildings. So this is the particular infographic that this one group advocacy, obviously, that they wanted to promote. This was another one, all right, with no full-time certified librarian. So they had a whole bunch of data to pick from, and they just chose one or two bits, because on an infographic, you obviously can't include everything. And they used the uh, full-time licensed library media services eliminated by decade. Wow. Right, I don't think it's supposed to be 1910. I think it's supposed to be 1960, but <laughs> it says 1910, the first one. I, I can't imagine that they had data back then. I'm a school library media specialist, but anyway. And this was another one that they did, and they used uh, Otto Neurath created this uh, isotype, this particular kind of language that allows you to represent objects with the least possible amount of detail and still know what it is. So they used basically isotype for those little men. Um, I don't think they have any little women. All right. So this was, they were trying to advocate that library media specialists impact student achievement, and yes, they do. This is the budget cuts to K-5 Ohio schools. All right, so they had a survey they put out, and included in it was the uh, reduced budgets and stable budgets. So this one was put out by uh, Library Research Services and the Colora Colorado State Library, and they put out this advocacy infographic about school librarians and student achievement. I would have called it school librarians and student achievement, not school libraries and student achievement, because <laughs> Very nice you have the room, but you need the person in the room. So um, I did write them a note and ask that they change the title. But whether they will or not, I don't know. And ALA has created an advocacy uh, graphics about the state of public libraries and funding. So on the right-hand side, the thing about showing infographics, obviously, is they're long and skinny because you have unlimited space on a web page. So I just pulled out some of the components so you can see them a little bit. Bigger. And in 2010, OCLC put out this piece. All right, and this is how public libraries stack up. All right, again, advocacy. Now, promotion of your program is another way to use infographics. And Karen Holt, in her Librarian Lifestyle blog, showcases how you can use an infographic to showcase the impact of your library's Facebook page to your administration. So she used one of the tools that pulls all the information from your Facebook page and puts it in a nicely created infographic. This, so you're seeing blow-ups of the infographic on the right side. And that tool is visually with dot .ly, visual dot .ly. So anybody can do that from a Facebook page. And Nebraska Learns showcases how to tell your library's story with infographics. Here is one that a teacher in a course created using infogram and pictochart about her public library book sale. So you can see the difference in those two particular tools. So, you know, infogram, well, the data is all there, not so pretty. But on the right hand side, pictochart, they have some really nice themes. So obviously she was trying to showcase which one would be more appealing to whatever audience was interested. Andy Morton created this informational infographic using Photoshop and free clip art images. 
he states that it took him about eight hours. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is a promotion for his library media center. And then on uh, the YASLA site, there's a sample of a promotional infographic created by Priscilla Dando, and she just used PowerPoint to showcase her library during National Library Week. So any kind of image-based layer editing tool can be used. PowerPoint works just fine. All right, but obviously it's a lot easier to use something like PictoChart or, or one of the ones that have all the great themes. One right. of the things we do is with, with the students, yeah. um, because PowerPoint has this, the, the data and graphic, uh, graphing um, elements, um, we'll create some of the graphs in PowerPoint using the, the graphing tools and then save them as JPEGs and bring them into Pictogram easily and uh, a Pictochart easily and uh, visually. You can see me again now, right? I can, yes. Okay. The other one that, um, there's one called Chart Chooser, which is an interesting site. It has 17 different data visualizations <clears throat> and you can choose the data visualization you want your data to look like if you don't care about teaching graphing and drag it down and it comes down in PowerPoint graph format or, it, or in, Power, or in uh, Excel, either way. So you can plop it into your PowerPoint and put your data into it or plop it into Excel and create it that way. Kathy, so I have a hunch that you've gathered all this stuff together in a convenient website for us. I have, and I'll give you the URL right in the chat box. Um, Linky.com is my son's URL. Info. So that's the URL. And all my stuff that I told you about that's kind of weird groupings of stuff is. Truck's Guide to Everything because I just couldn't think what else to call it. So, and that's there. That's a great title. My husband thought it was self serving. I'm like, no, that means I can put anything there. I could have said anything, but I wanted to say everything. So, I think that one of the things you told me early on was put your name on stuff. That was a lesson you learned. Right. And it, yeah, I mean, I just learned it by because the guy that started hosting my website, he thought that I would be the Martha Stewart of the educational internet and I I fought him and but he was right so. you and you and that's what you became right well yeah I, I don't know some people said it's the Michael Jordan I like kind of like the Michael Jordan of the educational internet but you know <laughs> <laughs> okay I see how that works for you it's pretty funny it's very <laughs> funny it's very funny that people always come up with something you know mm -hmm. and as people get younger <laughs> they wind up being different people that they're comparing you to but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. so very cool. So um, let, let's let's um, put it out to the class or the, the students who are here. Yeah. Um, do you have any questions of Kathy? Uh, about any about Kathy anything? And Moran have joined us since um, since we last introduced the class. <laughs> what are and you doing with the iPad apps? Say it again. What um, what you had said that you had been working on a press? I just had a teacher who went to something with iPads. I don't know what it was, but she said I have to talk to you about it like today. I have to talk to you about this. I just went to this thing. It's about iPads. She's a fantastic teacher. She's like a phenomenal teacher. So I'm like it must be something really good. So I'm curious to know more about what you're doing with that. Well, I'm doing a whole bunch of stuff, but I only concentrate on the. Um on the creation side of the iPad, not the consumption side. So, you know, if people ask me for a second grade fraction app, I have no idea, nor would I ever, you know, a student taught second grade, but that was a long time ago. I wouldn't know a, a good one from a bad one, uh, teaching it correctly or not correctly. I um, But I do a lot with Blooms. I tie pretty much everything to Blooms, something that, of course, has changed since I was in education school, to the new revised Blooms. Um, and just I thought I really feel that for teachers to start using iPad apps they just need to think of a use a pedagogical model as a base blooms is pretty easy to use as a base and everyone had it at some point in undergraduate education if you're an educator so uh, I've been tying a lot of stuff to blooms people tie them to all different things but I just 
um, I, I was t talking about it earlier, I just created one that um, does a whole bunch of activities at each level of blooms with different apps, but then uses the same app for a different assignment, a different product, different content, different products at each level of blooms, but using the same app. So rather using a screencasting app to do um, to create something at each level of blooms. The earlier one was using media literacy lessons about a YouTube video that's pretty famous and I did 10 media literacy lessons but then the person that did the media literacy lessons ideas hadn't taught them the blooms so I asked him if I could and he said yes and I did and mm -hmm. he agreed that I put them in the appropriate place and then I used his lesson ideas and then I created the product. So it's all about the creation and the ability to, you know, I mean obviously... That's, that's definitely where I want to go, that's definitely what I'm thinking and I know that's what this teacher is thinking more along Bloom's taxonomy and yeah. creation end of things rather than consumption end of things. Do you have a resource, is, is there a resource <laughs> on one of the links? I, I know that that's probably a loaded question but on one of the ones you've already given us is... Are, uh, yeah, in the... This one's for iPad, so I'll just give you this one. So uh, my newest one the, let me just get you the correct address for the blue for the page um, for the hold on. Just open another browser here. I always forget the URL. Probably you can't unless you give it. You give the web page such an easy name, you can't change the title of the web page. So it, you know if you want to call it iPads. It has it's this long thing here. Hold on, iPads in the classroom here. So this one is more through lifetime, but the one at each level of blooms is yet a different page that just gives you five or six, whether it's Android, Web 2.0, iPad, or Google Apps at each level of blooms, just to get you started. So that's the other one. That's the really pretty one, isn't it? That's the pretty one, yes. Cool. It looks like uh, Loren was asking you a question, uh, a personal oh, question. Thing. If you're going to buy yourself a new laptop or dis or and decide, what would you buy? A mm -hmm. new or, or device under $1,000. Under $1,000? Um, who's Loren? Raise your hand. She's uh, second from the right. Okay, there you are. So, Mac or PC? Can she not talk? Hi. Um, oh. I have a Mac for school and a PC for home, and I'm going to throw this PC out the window momentarily. My Mac at, for There's school will not allow right Google Hangout. <laughs> I'm getting oh. a refill. While I'm listening in. Okay. Um, yeah, you, you, um, so if it's under $1,000, kind of be hard pressed to, I mean the only thing you can get on the Mac side, when well, you can get a Mac Mini, do you have a nice monitor with your PC? I, I it's a laptop. Oh it's your PC is a laptop. Dell laptop. Do you have a monitor, like a decent sized monitor at all at home? No, but I can probably get my hands on one. Okay, so I'd probably, I'd probably, unless you want a laptop, I mean the, 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 the MacBook Air, the smallest one is $9.99 or something, um, but it it needs. I wouldn't recommend the bottom level one of that, but if you got a Mac Mini, you can get a Mac Mini and an iPad Mini for a thousand dollars, both those things. So, um, I would. That's what I would do. If I'd probably get the Mac Mini for home, put the big monitor on it, bigger monitor, put a monitor on it, and then uh, buy, get a Mac Mini, uh, iPad Mini. Excuse me. Do you have an iPad? No, I need one. Okay, my just school, get a, my school needs them too. <laughs> okay, but you know what? Just I mean, for, for your, if you're buying it for yourself for three hundred and twenty nine bucks or whatever the heck it is, just get the mini. I actually sold my iPad <laughs> because I had just gotten the newest one, and the iPad Mini came out on the same day, and they both came, and I and I wasn't even using the iPad, so I sold it to a teacher in California with all the other things I had that went with it, this whole big bundle of stuff because all I I carry the mini with me all the time. And it's perfectly fine for doing everything you need to do. So, okay. um, you know, and, and if you can afford a hundred extra dollars, get you know, get the one with twice the amount of, get the thirty-two gig one if you can, just because sixteen gig will be swapping in and out 
apps a lot. Not a lot, but you know, if you want to do some creation on it, that does take some space. And you have Keynote and everything at work. You have iWork at school. Yes. Oh yeah, shucks. Get yourself. Yeah. Or if you don't, you know, if you don't really want another laptop, but I think you should have still have to have a computer at home. Yeah. So I just get a Mac Mini. I got one for my office. The only thing it doesn't have a CD drive, so you just gotta borrow a portable one when you wanna install software. But, okay. You know, or mount it on another Mac. Like bring it into school and put the CD in your Mac at school, and then mount that one, and then you can use it. You're, 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 you're well, no, you can't because it's a Mac Mini. Never mind. Never mind. I don't remember the last time I really needed to use a CD. Just for installing, like, legacy software. Yeah. Well, most of the time, uh, you know, when I'm buying new stuff, I, I download it. Well, okay. yeah, it yeah, it depends. Yeah, I mean, it's true. With, with the Mac App Store, you can do that. But, I mean, I have a, I have a Windows, um, Windows 8 tablet. I have everything. I have a Windows 8 tablet with Windows Professional on it, not, um, not the RT version from Samsung. And that's pretty nice also. And that was, that's under $1,000. Even with the keyboard, it comes apart. I can show you it if you want. And I have a Chromebook too. That's another cheap alternative for lots of good things. Sounds like you've got quite a museum over there. I have every, well, yeah. That's all new stuff. I don't keep anything. I don't keep stuff very long. <laughs> people send you. Try, you know, people are on my list. There's lists of people that were waiting for my stuff. So. Yeah. No, do people send you presents? No. Um. Sometimes it not not big presents like that. I did just get I I did did just get a Wacom. No, it's not called Wacom. It's called Wacom. I always called it Wacom, but they yelled at me. It's Wacom. W I think in my head W O K O M. Wacom. Um, nice drawing tablet. That's oh, you have those. But what, that's wireless. They're giving me the, they're sending me the wireless module, and I'm writing in the middle of writing a blog post, but then I'm having a contest. And people, I don't know what they're going to have to do for the contest yet, but you have to do something, and then I'm going to randomly use a random number generator, and a teacher will get one. Oh, nice. So that'll be cool. Yeah, I'll be tweeting out about that when, when, uh, when I decide. They have to approve what I want to do. I haven't decided, but, yeah. So I've been playing with that. That was a new one. That was pretty cool. It's a pen, it's a pen and create, pen and create, touch and create, create and touch. So you can use it as a touchpad, but you can be wireless, so you can walk somewhere. Well, not really. You have to be kind of... Not that far. Has a USB dongle that goes in the computer, but you can control the computer from the from the touchpad when you're not standing there. With. It's pretty nifty. It is. So, so that was cool. I haven't gotten anything that big in a while. That was pretty cool. Uh, who else has questions of Kathy? Bridget joined us in the last few minutes, and uh, I'm not sure who else joined us. Let's see. Uh, Beth, we have three Beths. Beth is <laughs> joining us. Um, so, does anybody have questions of Kathy? Um, we were talking earlier about digital storytelling. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite digital storytelling? Do you have one like that you prefer to use over something else? Uh, as far as the apps, you mean? Well, either apps or web or a web to app applications as well. Oh, well, I I didn't really look too much into web applications, but I do have some um, apps work too. I I pretty yeah. I mean, I like I I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven on the list. Um, one of the newest ones is uh, Telagamy. Have you seen Telagamy? No. It's it's oh it's T E L L A G A M I. And those of you that have been using Google for a while, do you remember Google Lively? Anybody but right? Google Lively was Google's virtual world. Well, in Telagamy, you actually make your little avatar, and then your avatar can tell a story. And your avatar, I mean, it's it's pretty nifty. So I have I did some of that. Um, I use things like sock puppets on the iPad. That's my favorite app of all time. Um, of course, Animoto, Screen Chomp, again, Story Robe, We Video, Pix and Tell. I like Pix and Tell on the iPad. For telling digital stories, I was just using that today to to do one of the my assessments in my presentation. Um, Meograph also that's a Web 2.0 tool. I had a little trouble with that one. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't work so great all the time. Yeah. Um, but you know, those are the ones that I 
have identified as for creation of digital stories. But, you know, digital stories, there's a wide range of interpretations of what is and isn't a digital story. So what we're looking at right now is um, the students are creating instructional stories to, to embed yep. in, in LibGuides. Yep. So um, we're using uh, some folks just shout out what some of the stories you're using for this mod for the, the products you're using for this mod. So so, so we've had a few go animates. My brain chart. My brain chart? Sure. That was really oh, brain shark, yeah. Caitlin, that worked real well. Yeah. Did you like that one? Yeah, I liked it. It was really easy. The nice part is I got long winded and I had to re edit so I could go back and edit my uh, recordings even after I finished. So it's not one of those that once you're done, you have to go back and redo everything. You can edit multiple times. So I really liked it. Is anybody doing anything using the iPad or no? You're just using Web 2.0 tools for this stuff? We haven't, certainly people can use the iPad, but we're basically the two products are going to wind up, um, there's going to be an annotated bibliography that's going to have a, a digital story um, as a present presentation tool um, that's, yep. gonna, that's addressing a, a problem, a, an ed tech problem. And then the, the, the second large product is a libguide, and they need to embed um, the digital stories and all, all the resources in the libguide. And what are you doing, what are you doing? all that in on um, they, they've got a whole bunch of options so it's it's theoretically possible that they could create on a tablet and then grab embed code and put it wherever they want to. right but I mean what do you I mean what do you okay so you're so the your end result you're not embedding in you're not doing like a Google site or a Weebly page or no, I mean, they, they're, they're using a wiki as their... Oh, wiki, okay. They're using a wiki for their personal learning portfolio, and a LibGuide is the, the um, kind of communication vehicle that they're using um, to publish. And so, um, basically, we're mashing up a whole bunch of things. So, okay. so on the LibGuide, and we've got free, free LibGuides to use for the class, so, um, and, and you can, anybody can get that for library school. Yeah. So, so basically, there's um, they're they're embedding um, various different infographics and poster products and storytelling things and digit and and they can use uh, we we've introduced like probably a hundred different tools and and it's their their choice to to mash up what they want to do to communicate um, an instructional unit in a libguide for a particular group of learners. I see. Oh, sounds so, great. So they're look they're uh, right now we're on the lookout for um, digital storytelling tools and and kind of flipping tools so they can create some kind of instructional story for this week. I don't I don't use the F word. Flipping. <laughs> Not no flipping for you. No flipping for me. Okay. <laughs> it is it's out there. We should look at it. Look at it? Yes. Yep. Look at okay, it. tell us how you really tell us how you feel, how you really, really feel. <laughs> um, yeah. Or not? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm just. I'm being recorded. Um, my feeling is that um, it's always good teaching practice to provide students with um, material that they can get to um, anytime, any place for review or for you know introduction. And in a classroom setting, project-based learning is been shown to increase student engagement and increase student achievement and all of that. That's all good teaching. Um, it doesn't have to be a flipped thing. And I've seen too many uh, implementations that are not good teaching practice both on both ends, whether it's the thing that the student is looking at or it's what's going on in the classroom. So it's really about good pedagog sound pedagogical teaching and learning and uh, what works best and you know it's just there's so many things to consider when you're having students looking you know I mean uh, parents of seventh grade kids are in our towns are driving them to the public library so they can get to a computer that has internet access so they can watch the thing that they have to watch before they go to school. So, um, you know, it, it's just it, the whole digital divide thing is, is a big deal also. So, all those things. But my feeling is project-based learning is challenge-based, authentic, 
maybe problem, but more project hands-on learning is really where it needs to be. And uh, there's still nothing wrong with the teacher standing up in front of the class during that period of time. My feeling is if they would block schedule things and teachers would have more than 50 minutes, I think that would solve a lot of the um, of the problem of making sure the students are introduced, understand, and then are able to do a project all within the school environment. So that's how I really feel. So you really feel that all of those op all those various different types of teaching can happen within a I'm in a block and and I love the block. Yep. Um, and and so you feel that all those different types of teaching can happen within a 90 minute block. Oh, I definitely agree. I definitely think so. And I remember when our district went to the block, and uh, it was <laughs> it was rough going until teachers realized you really couldn't, you know, lecture for ninety minutes. And even though you, but you had to because you had to get through the content. But now with project based learning and students, you know, breaking up the project, the the content into components where students are teaching each other with the you know, the teacher having the final say to make sure that all the content is gotten through. Um, it can easily be done with technology. Uh, I would imagine that has to be, oops, I gotta, I gotta go. That's okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> bye. You know why. You can I, explain. Take care, Kathy. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Hi, honey. Good. How are you doing? I hope Kathy knows we okay, she, oh, so we can't hear her any longer. But that was so kind of her to to, to be here with us. Um, so, what, any reactions to Kathy's feelings about flipping? I, I had a question on the tip of my tongue to ask. Oh, how how you um, how you the, the the timing thing? It's it's always about the time, right? You know, it's always about how much time things take and and um, standardized tests and teaching to the test and how do you. Um, how do you get everything to fit in and you know how do you meet all the the things for the test and still do the project based learning which has been my challenge with teachers it's like we can't do a project because we have to cover this content so that was the question i wanted to ask her like how do you how do you um, reconcile that the the time and the uh, and the content i guess well, you know what? Well, if you want Kathy's answer, you can write her. She is so accessible. Email her or tweet her. Um, she will. She will answer you. Uh, but let's let's kind of brainstorm together. Um, anybody have any any ideas about that? That's a problem we all face, isn't it? Yes, we. It definitely is a drawback with the project based type of thing because it is hard to cover content. But what I think when I I didn't understand flip to be that the lesson would be at home as much. What I looked at is with all this digital uh, storytelling um, things that I've been introduced with this course, that I can now have students watch these things in class there, which frees me up to look at are they getting it? Can I walk around the room? Can I see? Because they are so tuned into media that they enjoy watching something that's on the screen. And I agree with her. Expecting them to sit and watch at home, it's like when teachers used to say, oh, go watch this Hall of Fame, Hall, Hallmark Hall of You couldn't count that every kid could get to a TV and watch it. You, like you can't count that you can give a project and kids at home can work together on a project. I've never given an out of school project where I expect my students to get together on their time out of school. If it's a project, it's done in school. You can bring materials from home, but you need to do it in school because I don't think that's fair. There are kids that cannot get, ha do not have access to get to other children. All right, what, what, how does everybody else feel? I agree with her. I think that's true. I see that at my school. And it's not just about the, the having the tools. It's about having the family support at home. Like they have parents who don't know how to guide them or help them or show them things. And a lot of times they need, they need an adult to do, that, do a lot of the projects. So a lot of things that our teachers assign to do it, they don't assign them at home they do try to do them in class but so, say, an issue. so say that you are helping teachers archive how to solve for X and say that Susie has always had trouble solving for X 
and say that you put up the ultimate video on solving for X and now mom and dad can help Susie solve for X. Now your name's attached to that video and, and, and mom and dad are saying, oh thank goodness that Jackie's in our school because she's created this resource for us to enable us to help Susie learn how to solve for X and get her ready for math class tomorrow. This remediation notion and the idea that teachers are not only at school but also at home with their instructional voice can be pretty powerful. When at the point of need, um, it is. I think it's a public relations vehicle as well as an instructional vehicle. Now, does everything need to be flipped? I'm not so sure, and I think that you all bring up really good points about what has to happen in the classroom or the library. But I think that um, we now are we have so many expert voices um, that we don't need to necessarily be the ones to produce the vi video on solving for X, but we can curate the content for that eighth grade math teacher or whatever it is and and really show that we are we're helping at home so um, you know I think there's a whole bunch of of nuances in this flipping movement and I think that everybody's viewing it and I can see by the way we're responding everybody's viewing it in a different way and 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 maybe the needs of each school and the needs of each class are different um, but what I know I'm doing in my school is everybody all the teachers in my school are at a different point so when I happened to introduce mentor mob to the math teachers they went nuts because all of a sudden they got how they could put together the Khan Academy videos they need the math train videos they need their own instruction that they were gathering from um, archiving the smart board stuff that they were doing the, during the course of the day and the student created video that was happening so they were create they were able to as I was trying to help them with the Moodles, the wikis, the Google sites and, 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 and bringing all this other stuff in, I would see what each teacher needed and help them um, kind of, you know, here's the landscape they're comfortable in, here's the platform they like. So using the tools that I'm introducing to them, help them really pull together the instruction, some of which they're using in school, as, as Beth was saying, and some of which they're saying, hey, you know, we did introduce this in class, but if you're having trouble, look at this over and over and over again, if you need to. Some students are not going to need to. So this really kind of individualizes the program as well as presents some, some um, strategy for remediation. Um, and so in addition to just pushing the lecture at home, you've got a bunch of different things that, that flipping can do. Whether you like calling it flipping or you want to call it something else, we have new tools and new resources and new strategies for creating instruction that we can now employ. And I, you know, I don't know whether the flipping model works for you, but I think we need to recognize as librarians that this stuff is too powerful for us to ignore. Is there any kind of research on, like, real research on people that have adopted the model and? been successful with it or you know at different levels too because we're all at different teaching right. levels you know like I'm not sure elementary is, is the best place for that you know we think that that's probably more high school when they've learned those independent skills but are, are there the only research I've seen has come in come out of the flip network okay. which is going to be a little bit biased possibly yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> and, I, and the criticisms out there so you're not the first person to mention that however one of the things I know is that when I need, like, okay, so I'm going to Texas next weekend, right? And I'm going to Billy Bob's, and I have forgotten how to two-step. You know, I wish somebody had pulled together for me the best YouTube videos on how to two-step. And if I were my librarian, I would have pulled them together for me. But And I will. Welcome back, Kathy. Um, you, you said something powerful and you got some strong reaction. How is Mr. Schrock doing? We can't hear you. Can't see her. <laughs> Ooh, there she is. I don't know if you can hear me, Kathy. 
but um, you 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 um, hit a chord here, and a lot of people agree with you about flipping. So I've been trying to, uh, I guess, play devil's or angel's advocate here, and um, and and creating an argument for the notion of librarians pulling together instruction um, to support remediation, um, to support going back and reviewing. Um, to introduce some of the nuts and bolts things that people don't want to teach over and over again. And for me, um, you know what I, you know, for me, archiving the stuff that um, is my voice, but I can't necessarily be in the classroom over and over again. And throughout the school, like I would like to have my little video on how to create a solid thesis be available even when I'm not across the school in the science classroom. Oh, absolutely. Can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, de definitely for because you teach that in person. But yeah, I was basically it's talking kind about of a hybrid. It's a hybrid approach, I think. They've heard my voice. They've heard my instructional voice, right. and then they will forget it. Right. You know, Until they need it. <laughs> Until they need it, and then they won't right. remember it. Right. And exactly. So then, Mrs. Dr. Smith in the science department will say, "Do you remember what Dr. Valenza said to you about this?" Let me bring her voice up, and I'm right there. Yep. Yeah, I, 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 I have no. I think that's perfectly fine. I just, it's the whole regular classroom notion of it. I, I just have a little bit of a problem with a the lot other, of. It. The, I think the other argument is like what I'm seeing a lot of, too much of, and this is not necessarily in Springfield, but maybe in a bunch of other places, yep. is that there are teachers who will spend an hour of instructional time showing a discovery video. And is that the best? And I think that's what Sam's and I forget the other gentleman's name say. Is this the best use of my instructional time? Right. It's not. And the reason that the discovery videos are in little components is so you can show five minutes. <laughs> yeah, of fun. Bad example. Not. <laughs> I know. No, I understand. But I know. Yeah, but I do. But the, again, so what do you do with the kid that you know? I mean, as long as the student has access to it at home or earlier in school or after school or some other time. You just have to make sure that, I mean, you know, I live on Cape Cod. There's people that, you know, don't have computers, but if they do have computers, they might not have internet. And so you just have to be cognizant of the fact that not everybody, everybody's got a pencil, piece of paper and pencil at their house, but not everybody has the internet. So is there some way to make sure that every kid gets what they need to get in order to be prepared? for the next day because then they're just going to get farther behind so but, so people agreed with me yay so I'm sorry I had to leave oh, everybody did. <laughs> I'm sorry I had to leave so quickly no, no. I we completely understand the, especially those of us who were with you earlier yeah right everybody else is like where is she going I gotta go <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there was there are some people with other questions I think yep. who were going oh darn Kathy left and Jackie joined us and I'm not sure if anybody else joined us in the meantime um, who else has a question of Kathy Schrock? About anything, remember. I have an opinion on everything, so it's okay. Well, I, I don't have a question yet for you, Kathy, but um, Joyce, I have a question more for you. Um, in the discussion board, see, I thought um, you were talking about like there was a difference between flipping and tutorials. And sometimes I feel like um, the things that you've created are more tutorial type things and it's wonderful for them to be available at home or um, in their spare time or even to use them while you're in the library and they're there because that frees you up, like I said, to walk around, to be at their computers with the master listening to you one-on-one -on -one here and there, making sure they're in the right spot. Because when you teach middle school children, you know, you, just making sure that they're all on the same page or in the same spot in their computer. They're not, you know. You, you have to physically walk and do that. And that's so hard to do when you're trying to deliver instruction. So I look at this ability to create my own thing and it's there and I'm teaching but I'm able to walk now and really observe what they're doing which I couldn't I can't do when I'm you know teaching something because it's very hard and when you've had um, ob people who observe you who sit in the back of the classroom and oh that kid wasn't paying attention and this kid's chewing gum and but you know all these <laughs> you know, and you're trying to deliver content it's 
it's I don't, it's difficult. You know what, Beth? I think whatever works for learning. And it honestly, you don't have to say this is this is a model, and you it, it's got particular rules. Um, I think what we're putting out there is a you know some strategies. And so, if an element of this works for you, great. I don't think that every program should be totally. Right. I wouldn't. I, I I don't think I could do that. But uh, you know what? I I'm taking from this movement the things that work for me. I would prefer to have the 90 minutes I spend with most of my classes engaged in constructivist experiential activities. I would prefer that if the students could watch a video, a, lo a lengthy video at some other time, and that I could do something more active with them that's the way I'd prefer to spend my time with the learners that I have. If I could also use that video and have a kind of active listening experience like a back channel happening during that video, then for me that's that's a good use of video video in my library or in the classroom. And if there was some kind of engage, if we were able to chunk it, for instance, like the discovery videos and had engaging discussions at various different points, yes. But um, I mean, there there are some things like there are some lessons I hate to teach, and 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 I want that to be. I don't necessarily want to do that five times a day, you know. <laughs> um, and so I think that you don't have to follow a specific group of rules relating to flipping or any of these things. Think about use your judgment. What makes sense for your learners? What makes sense for your teachers and their teaching styles? Um, and what in your heart do you know is right? So don't worry about the rules. Um, take with this what works for you, and 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 get everybody else jump in here in terms of your ideas. I don't think that I, I believe in any doctrine at all. I think when we are having our discussion boards, that's pretty much what it came across as: is that we all have what works best for us as an elementary for elementary school. I I like the idea of having the kids when I'm pushing into a classroom on my flex time, if they can show an instructional video of how we're going to do the skill and then I'm actually working with the skill because I have limited time. I think that's flipping my library time. But like for the 40 minutes I have with my students, I don't see being able to get them outside of class without taking classroom instruction time to watch a video. But if I'm going to push in, I can get the teacher to show like a 15 minute video maybe right before I get there. So it's I think, like you said, it depends on each person. And we're having the debate between is it a tutorial at one point and is it flipping and I think it depends on how you do it. If I'm showing a presentation and I'm saying the same thing I would do if I was in front of them and it's not, not just saying this is how you use SIRS Discover. If I'm just telling them how to use it, I see that as a tutorial. But if I'm going, okay, we're going to be using this to do XYZ, this is how this works. When I come in, we're going to talk about how can we use this for this project. It's no longer tutorial, but giving them something to think about for when I come in, not just go ahead and use it, but okay, let's talk about what you just saw and how are we going to use this next. That's how I think the difference. I, and that's, that's a good point. And I always felt as a library media specialist, a lot of what I did was process, was tutorial. So it, explaining how to do something. You know, and whichever way, and then having the students do it. So, um, it, in a library setting, I, I would say that instruction sometimes, well, a lot of times in my middle school library look like tutorials. So I think you're right. Um, it's nice if you can, if they have some of the skills, at least they know what's coming and some of the skills, especially, I mean, I would see them, you know, once a week. And Joyce, I know, understand what you're saying. I would teach seven fourth grades in a day, and by the last one, I'd be saying, "Did I say that to you? Or did I say that to somebody else?" <laughs> so at least if it was if it was captured when I was fresh, um, there they could have the benefit of me not being a blithering idiot by the end of the day. So, and and I love the idea of the students creating the instruction, and we've we've done a lot of that, uh, and then I I validate it by using it over and over again and and having the students talk about it um, and 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 I think that my I, I think that our preposition itis video um, is things that are, are needed over and over again right. I flip 
and, and so what is flippable, what is not flippable? Do I need to teach about not ending a, se a sentence with prepositions over and over again? Or can I send that home? Can I have kids practice that after looking at, at that video? Um, and what I, I, the thing I don't know is, you know, I can see some granular statistics on my LibGuides about how often that video is used. I don't know where it's used, but I do suspect that it's used in English and social studies and over and over again because the teachers will say, stop everything, your writing sucks, yeah. let's go over it's versus it's versus it's, or their versus their versus their, or your versus your, or, you know, and, and, and the videos that these kids created a few years back have legs, and, and, and they're also available at home. And I think, Kathy, one of the things I was saying when you were gone is that I want parents to associate the fact that the librarian has done this instruction um, with me, and I think I want them, the parents to associate this with you because they're going to be thankful that this stuff is there when they work with their students at home. And um, whether it's formally flipping or not, um, you're there as a helpful voice and they may not even know who a librarian is, but if a student says, oh darn it, I have to write a thesis tonight, I don't know what to do, and the parent's going, uh-huh, like I think I wrote a thesis in the past, but if you have a poster, a video, a step-by-step -step tutorial on this, then then that kind of kind of hybrid instruction may not be flipping, but it, it's valuable. Weren't you doing that before this whole movement, though? Absolutely. I don't. Okay. I, you know, I don't think that I. I don't need this name for it. Honestly, okay. I'm just. I'm introducing it because I want these students to be aware of what people are talking about. And and you and I were both doing this way earlier. Than, than this. We were creating it with HyperCard, weren't we? <laughs> no, I wasn't because I wasn't a Mac user. I wasn't a Mac user, so sorry. Oh, stop rubbing that in. I, I, I am now, but I wasn't. There are so many differences. This the Kathy and the Joyce version of a lot of things. <laughs> and now I'm the consummate Mac user, so. <laughs> <laughs> you are a turn coat, you uh, New England girl, aren't you? I am. Yeah, okay. So, other questions. We, we are so fortunate to have Kathy with us tonight, and I want to respect your time, so um, I don't want to talk anymore. You ask her some questions before before we, we wish her good night, and Caitlin loves Max. Who has not spoken yet? While I was here. You might have spoken when I wasn't here. <laughs> I have more of an observation, well, a comment. Today I was scoring, I'm in New York, New York City specifically, and I was scoring um, third grade ELA um, short responses. And one of the things that came up is that their students were, um, Cite, we've, we've been teaching, I'm middle school, but in middle school we always talk about citing evidence and showing evidence, and a lot of the third graders were doing this, <laughs> poor little things. Anyway, they were doing it, but they were copying, there was no, this is my opinion, this is no I in there. They were just simply copying from, you know, the question. They understood the question, because right. what they were copying referred to the question, but we were told today that we have to give zeros to that because they had to put part of how they felt, their opinion. And, oh boy, I mean that was, to was not told to us yesterday, so in the afternoon when we were, you know, um, checking answers, we were giving them, okay, they have something in there referring back to the article and shows some kind of comprehension. But today the state said, well not the state, Pearson, the company that produces the exams said that's a zero so I, you know my my comment is what is the state of this common core and these companies telling us how to grade our children and wasn't it at one point these tests were really used to give us an indication of how to help the kids and now it's kinda what's against them you know and that's my comment <laughs> it was kinda sad so, I mean, you're, you're actually being a score for the standardized tests in New York State? Mm-hmm. Well, New York City. New York, New York City. City. Yeah. 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 And there's yeah, so I, much writing on this now. You know, right. Just, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it'd be interesting. I mean, I don't know the standards well enough to know, but 
did, did they ever students ever have a you know a piece on reflection I know with my graduate students they don't do papers for me they do reflections mm -hmm. and it is until the third week that I can get that and they're practicing teachers all of them to, to, to put the eye in there and not do some formal running header title page thing right. tell me what you think um, it's and, and and they're adults so you know, here. <laughs> right I mean and, and right and 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 do they even would they even I guess they would understand if you explain if someone explained at some point yeah. but they probably hadn't any practice no, in the teachers, reflection I my understanding is most teachers, and once again, I'm middle school, yep. but a lot of the teachers are cite the evidence, show the evidence from the text, right. show the evidence right. from the text, and this is kind of what they're doing, and just Have not you, putting um, the eye there. It's, it's, I think at third grade, it's really hard to discern those kinds of differences, but I think one of the things I like about Noodle Tools is it scaffolds your different reactions to text. And so if you're looking at a note card in Noodle Tools, and you don't need Noodle Tools to do this, but it separates your response into um, quote, paraphrase, and my own ideas. Mm -hmm. And so those are the three ways you can respond to text. Do I find, if, I, if I'm writing, and this is not natural, testing is not a natural response, but if I'm, if I'm creating an essay in response to this, I'm going to do one of those three things. Why would I quote? And when would I quote? And I would quote when I have statistics. I would quote when I find a piece of prose that is particularly purple. It says something in a way better than I could ever say it in a million years. Mm -hmm. I would paraphrase when, hey, I could say that just as well. Let me put it in my own words, but I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to note that I got this information from someplace else. And, and I'm going to give them my own ideas when that I statement really pops into my head. I, oh, gosh, I really don't understand this, or I disagree with this completely, or did you think about this? Um, and, and I think we can scaffold that kind of response, and regardless of whether or not we're doing it for that test, I think that's an important way to respond. Um, with my, ELL, my ESL students, mm -hmm. I, I think from what I've seen, and I work with ESL a lot, they've been trained to to take evidence and paste it, and not necessarily come up with creative responses and and to play with opinions because they're reporting back whatever the, the educational system was where they came from. They were responsible for parroting back information, and I spent some time in Japan, and that's. What was what I, I observed there? Here, we want less with the Common Core than than before, but we really want, um, and I want. This is what I want to see. I want to see. So what? You know. So you've pasted these quotes together. Uh, you know. In what way is that creative? What patterns do you see here? In, in what, how are your conclusions different from um, the stuff that you've aggregated? And and what does all this? Sorry, mean. <laughs> in in the end, um, and and you know, where is my where is my voice as a writer, as a thinker, as a, as a learner, and 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 I ask those questions over and over again as I look at student work. But I think separating those 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 responses to what I'm reading into three buckets: the quote, paraphrase, and my own ideas scaffolds the kind of stuff that I think Pearson is looking for, for good or for bad. Okay. I'm going to see Debbie Avalock this week because I'm going to the New York Library Association SSL conference in Rochester. So are, you, are you going? I was there last year. I'm so jealous. I saw Debbie. Yeah, I can't wait to see her. I haven't seen her in a long time. So. And my love. I will definitely. It's interesting how close we all are. Isn't that? It's, it's so funny. Yep. You no. Know, we will dance together. <laughs> Had fun. You guys will be that 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 those people soon when you're as old as we are. Yeah, really. We'll be sitting and we'll be sitting back, <laughs> watching all of you have fun. And that's interesting because I think that's um, where you know Mary Kate Shelton is, and you know where the just the generation right beneath Before her. Before us, yep, exactly. Are you presenting at the conference? Yes, I am. I'm the keynote actually. Yep. Hmm. 
and yep, presenting infographics and uh, basically personal learning networks, but it's not called that. So we've been spending a lot of time on personal learning networks. It's called leading, uh, following change to lead change. So just how to build your personal learning network in a meaningful way so you can, and then build it out to help others. Following change to lead change. Shall us? Kind of sounds like Pinterest to me. <laughs> follow, follow people so I can change my own. And... <laughs> Kinda, yeah. No, I'm not at your level at all. I know. <laughs> no, no. It's just funny because it's funny. Well, actually, um, Pinterest is in it. Uh, I was not a Pinterest fan at first. Well, I'm still not really a fan, but I, I because the things I was trying to pin, like there was not even a there wasn't even a picture on the page, so they're really ugly. So I had to make my own pin first. So once I made my own pins for my stuff, I put it up. But in between there, I had like six pins. And I got on some list as the top 25 Pinterest using educators. I'm like, really? There's people with like a million and a half pins. I had six. So I quickly put together like pins to my own stuff. Uh, but I do have some, like now that you can have hidden pin boards, I do have hidden ones where I aggregate information until I'm done using it. And then I whack them in and I create you know other boards so it really is an easy way to I don't use it as an organizational tool except for my own links to things um, to my own stuff and and infographics some interesting infographics that I find other than that I just use it for myself for gathering assets for right. putting together presentations so and I think that we, we forget about the notion of personal knowledge management that it's okay to curate for yourself Absolutely, <laughs> pearl trees. I love it. I mean, yeah, I, I'm. That's to me. That's the uh, the whole social. I still consider that stuff social bookmarking. That whole thing and and learning from others and um, you know gathering, 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 and then curating it to a meaningful thing. I don't have to share that with everybody. Um, and then I put together a presentation based on the topic that I want to, utilizing stuff from other people with credit, and then that's the thing that I share when I'm so all done. Give us some tips. Who do you follow? It, where? In, on Twitter? Anywhere, like I, so any, anywhere. Um, well, I, I have 25,000 Twitter followers, and I follow, I think, 219. All right, so, so give and, us the best tips in any, in any category, or, and Jackie's well, asking a question. Is it possible to get an archive of, of this presentation or the one that you're doing in New York? No, the one in New York. Okay. Um, on my, there's an, <laughs> there's yet another URL. If you yeah. go to that shrockguide.net page and look for um, either creating your PLN, which is really the the meat of it, all the links to everything are there. And there's probably some version of the presentation embedded. If not, there's one called leading to leading change or okay. following change. I forget if it's the F or the L. But anyway, mm -hmm. there's going to be an embedded page there too. There's not that many things. There's only like 20 things down the side. So okay. Okay. at the shrockguide.net. Um, I yeah. So the um, so my tips for following are I have a core group of people I follow, and they're people that um, are pretty much like me um, as far as interested in both the hardware and the software sides, and the you know the good pedagogy. And then I people that can answer a question if I have. A question quickly whether I do it a one-to-one -one. but what I do when I'm investigating something new I'll follow a whole other group of people so if I'm doing something if I'm going to be speaking to administrators I'll go to Patrick Larkin's site I'll, who, Patrick Larkin's Twitter page and he has lists uh, that he's separated his people into little lists and so I'll go to the appropriate administrator list and then I'll grab all those people and follow them for the amount of time that I need to learn something whether I sometimes post questions to them I can't direct message some of them because they're not following me but at least I see their conversation and then I can just contact them outside of Twitter um, one thing I would strongly suggest that you do if you are a Twitter user is make sure that in your bio you put you're an educator and don't ask questions of people that can't be in, that can't be answered in 140 characters because um, it's ridiculous you know, what do you think are the top three blah, 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 blah. Well, if I could do that 140 characters, that would be great. But just pick the right tool for the job. You, my email address or everybody's email address should be in their Twitter bio. 
So you can just email somebody if you have a question. No, that's, that's so often that's not the case. No, I know, I know, I know, I, I know. I just tell everybody, make sure you put your email address in your Twitter bio so that when I have a, when you have a question or I have a question of you, that's going to be an answer that, you know, now it's this, they tweet me, then I tweet my email address back, then they email me, then I, you know, it's just, it's a ridiculously hard thing to do. So just make sure, you know, and if you don't want to use your, just create an email address to use for all that stuff if you don't want to get it mixed up with everything else. I don't care, but some people do care. And keep your tweets public. Don't hide them. I mean, unless there's a good reason to do that if you're working with students or whatever. But, um, you know, I want to see what you're tweeting too. So don't, you know, I, I might not want to follow you, but I want to look at your stuff. I'll put you on a list. I can put you on a list and not follow you and go look at your stuff every now and then, decide if I want to follow you. Um, I'm very picky. I go through every person who asks, who follows me and either keep them or block them based on what they do and what they know. So. Um, I, it's pretty hard. It's a lot of time to tune a personal learning network. A mm -hmm. lot of time. So, yeah. but once you get it tuned, it's wonderful. Yeah. So, so, do you learn more from Twitter than anything else? Um, what's your oh, favorite strategy? Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would say probably because of the people that I follow, I get introduced to very good things every day um, and places where then I can go yeah I mean I really I, but I also I mean I also aggregate tons of blogs I move from Google Reader to Feedly so I find people that way also so I find you know I, I use t all different kinds of, of ways to connect with people Pinterest I don't really um, I use if I'm looking for something, but most of the time, people they're not library media specialists. They don't organize their boards nicely, so they have this board of like everything. And there's one thing on there that I'm interested in, but I can't even find it. So, um, if I do suggest to people, if you're going to have Pinterest boards, make sure you you know break them down and make the board you know keep them separate, so it helps the rest of us use your stuff. Because people that know the topic, it's great when they gather stuff and put it in one place, but if you put it all in one big page, I can't figure it out. So, how do you like Feedly? I'm starting to use it, but I haven't got a feel for it yet. Yeah, I mean it's it's fine. It, I mean, the, just the fact that on the day that Google Reader closes, everything that you've starred <laughs> in Google Reader, they've written the API. It's going to all come over, so it's you don't lose anything. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, it, to me, I've been using it enough now that I usually most of mostly use it um, on the computer as opposed to you know on a tablet or whatever but yeah I mean I find it and I just look at titles of blog posts anyway so I'm finding it works really well really easy to use so do blogs have a future do blogs have a future that's a good question too um, yeah you know for a while I was saying blogs are so yesterday but it, truly I blog less but when I blog, I blog more. So I have less blog posts because I can pump stuff out in Twitter. But then if I see, like I'm considering a blog post about what really is an infographic and what isn't an infographic, for example. I have that one already in draft. I don't know if I'm going to push it out or not. But, you know, when I when, when something really, my, my blog posts, I think, are more meaning, meaningful. The, the most of my blog posts aren't anything meaningful except to me. They're mostly how-to's and, and gadget based but every now and then I throw in one something that I feel passionate about. Um, I have a blog on Discovery now too called Kathy's Catch, K-A-T-C-H, where I get to every month do something in depth, um, a topic that I'm interested in. So yeah, I mean I think blogs do still have and, and whether even if it's a link to tw in Twitter to a blog, <laughs> who cares? You know, I don't do that. Um, I do it for the Kathy's Catch sometimes if I'm working on a topic, but I don't do that for my regular blog. But I don't know, you know, uh, does RSS have a future? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think people do blog a little less than they did in the golden age of blogging. Which <laughs> Well, they blog less, but be, but I do think when they do blog, it's deeper. Maybe so I, that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Yeah. What's your favorite hashtag? I'm like, I've been following a few, and I'm trying to expand, but... Well, I have a list of um, 
hashtags in education on my shrekguide.net forward slash or linky.com forward slash Twitter page. Um, <laughs> so there's a list of the, I, you know, I don't, I, I have a little, well, I mean, obviously, you know, ed, ed chat, you know, those kind of things. But the thing is, I, I find I have problems with hashtags because everything gets mixed up. Like anybody could use that hashtag. For instance, someone just tweeted out to just now that they're at TIE, T-I-E, which is the South Dakota ISTE chapter. And instead of putting TIE 13, they, they put TIE. And they said, geez, if you use hashtag TIE, you fi find out a lot about, how to, about men's ties. So, you know, it's really hard to invent a hashtag that hasn't already been used. And you wind up with all these outliers in the list of hashtags. So that is a problem. Um, sometimes I, I don't have a favorite hashtag. I I very rarely put hashtags. If I'm at a conference, well, I have. Let me just go, step back. Um, one time I was at my desk and Steve Jobs was doing a you know his thing, and I was tweeting out like every two seconds because I figured people didn't have internet access, and I did. And um, but people complained because I was tweeting too much. So I created another Twitter. Um, account that I tell my people, my regular Twitter people, that for the next three days I'm going to be using this back channel. It's called like Shrock Back Chan or something. And I tweet all my conference stuff in there. So most of the time I'm using hashtags for the conference that I'm attending more than um, I, I I notice that when people promote my webinars like EdWeb because I have stuff with them, they put like, you know, Ed Chad and TL Chad and all this stuff. I don't I don't do that. I just I, I think that's too much. I mean, that the, there's so much stuff then in the hashtag, you wouldn't be able to get through it in any amount of time if everyone did that. So I'd rather find people that provide me with good stuff than to follow a hashtag personally. That's just me. Is that not what you wanted to hear? No, it's good. Like, I, there's some things I come across that is that sort of some of the hashtags I was following EdTech, and yeah. they have so many that go out to EdTech that there's no way... Yeah. that I can keep up with it, but we started, as I promote, self-promote, is we started TLLM for Teacher Librarians Elementary, yep. and so far it hasn't been, there's been stuff on it, but it's not enough that if you don't follow for a day or two, there's there's not a whole lot you can, you can catch up with whatever was going through it yet. So. Right, but what's good about the hashtag, if you go to, you know, the tech chat or TL, whatever one you, that had this, had the lot of them, you can look down and you can find good people to follow though. You know, it's a good way to locate people. Not necessarily go to the hashtag. Don't even, just look at the things people are posting and say, hmm, and then click on their head and you can see other things they post and then follow them. I mean, there's, the hardest thing is following, is finding the good people to follow. And once you do, you're, you know, you're golden. And once you start messaging them, not direct messaging them, then they start looking at your stuff because um, I look, like I said, I look at everybody who follows me, I look at their stuff, and I either block them or keep them. Some of them I follow. Uh, but then you can, you know, then once they follow you, you've got a direct message right to them, and, which is very handy. And everybody has a different style in terms of the curation thing. Like, I don't, I don't bother to block anybody. I just... I, I, block, I block companies. You block companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things I do find disturbing is people who use my name. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I know. You can't do anything attract. about that. No. Yeah. So they'll throw in, um, <laughs> you name name the subject, at Joyce Valenza. But, you, but it's funny because when you click on that and you click on them, you'll, all you'll see is the same post with all of our names on it, which is really bizarre. I yeah. mean, you look at it and it's the same message. But has all of our name, each one of our names, on a separate one. So they just take a whole group of, I don't know where people and do that. I know I hate that too, but nothing you can do about that. No, nothing you can do. No, and and then the other thing is the hashtag feeds the other curation tool. So if I'm creating, if I'm looking for ten hashtags that I want to feed my scoop it or or, or whatever else. Yeah. I need to use those hashtags, and then I can select what's coming in and, and push out the stuff that I think is important. Right, right. Yeah, so those are valuable to me. But every, I think everybody has a different style, and that's okay, too. Everybody flips or doesn't flip or, or thinks about the, the notion of tutorials in different ways. There's no rules, and I, you know, I think what we're trying to think about is there's no textbook for this practice. We're inventing this. Um, we're trying to figure out... 
nobody has really said here is what you need to do to be a 21st or whatever century teacher and 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 to do it thoughtfully and to to exploit the tools now available to you and so what we're saying to you is there here are 20 different ways you can approach it here's a way you can look at it for middle school here's a way you can look at it for third grade what works for you but we want you to have a toolkit available to you we want you to know and that's why all these different voices are here in our our class and we're grateful that people like Kathy are so generous and this is one of the wonderful things about this life there are people like Kathy who are generous enough to spend an hour with us on a Tuesday night and you know and and, and I'll return the favor to her she knows that um, but it, it, it people are very generous and and we're learning from each other and there is no established, there's no textbook, there's no established practice. Um, you will be creative with what you take away from this class as Kathy's students are with what they take away from hers. Um, but don't expect a prescribed list of, of what to do and what not to do. And there's no right or wrong either. I mean, you know, you're asking me, that's my opinion, that's how I use the tool. But I mean, I don't use Scoop It and I don't want to use Scoop It. So, I wouldn't, you know, that the hashtags have not a lot of meaning for me. For conferences that I can't attend, they have a lot of meaning for me. Other than that, I don't, I don't use them, and that's just me. That's not how I use Twitter. I use Twitter to get good information from very smart people and to, uh, and to give information back. You know, sometimes I'm, I, <laughs> it's always interesting because I have so many followers. When I tweet something personal, I get a whole bunch of different kinds of responses. Than I do normally when I'm tweeting technology stuff. So they just come out of the woodwork. Like mm -hmm. this weekend, I did a it was an International Marconi Day on a Saturday, and I my son had written an iPad app that had to do with ham radio. So I was at I worked a ham radio event at the National Seashore all day and helped people understand about ham radio. And uh, when I tweeted out about it, someone's like, "It's International Macaroni Day." I'm like, "No, no, no, Marconi Day." <laughs> She says, oh, I thought I could have all the carbs I wanted. <laughs> like, hey, Kathy, no. you know what, what April 26th is? April 26th is what? April 26th is Women Rewrite Wikipedia Day. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There I go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't, yeah she, don't get me started. It's too okay. late at night. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think Bridget, Bridget wants to know if you have a staff, Kathy. A staff? Like a like a like a like a staff for walking with? Yeah, no, I don't have a staff. <laughs> I wish I had a staff. <laughs> just to do my travel plans would be nice to have a staff. No, 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 it's just just me. <laughs> Although back in the early days, I um, when the website when Kathy Shark's Guide for Educators first came out in '95, in about '97, um, I so I would check all the links every month by hand. And I finally did an adopt a page, <laughs> like adopt, you know, like adopt a highway, but before wait. adopt a highway. And people would see if the, just click on the link and see if it worked. I didn't ask them to go find another one to replace it. I still did that. But um, so we had a list of, you know, in the page at the bottom was adopted by, and that worked. But that was about the only staff I ever had. And that was just teachers who were interested and um, knew that they could, you know, help out making sure everything stayed, stayed good. Do you know no, what I did for those dead links? I get I get kids uh, a Jolly Rancher for each dead link they found. <laughs> it was it really worked. Right, and now on the top of all my Weebly pages, I just tell people, um, you know, if you see a bad link, let me know, and and they do now. You know, they're really good about it, and so I can then just go and find something to replace it or find out where it went. Um, rather than check, because the guide when it closed had three thousand links, and I was still clicking on by hand. You had to you had to click by hand because, you know, a link checker would say, "Oh yeah, it's still good." While well, it went to a page and said, "Oh, this is no longer here." So, mm -hmm. you had to do it by hand. So. But no, no staff. Any other, any final questions? I want to make sure we've been on an hour and fifteen or so. Oh, okay. So I want to make sure that um, we we let Kathy get to bed. And or do whatever she's going to do. Yeah, five thirty um, at the gym tomorrow. Five thirty comes early. So oh, yeah, I know that's when I go to work. Um, okay. Any any final questions? Oh, Caitlin's still asleep at that time. Any final thoughts, Caitlin? Well, she's not still asleep now, Caitlin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By the way.
All right, so any final thoughts, of any advice for, for these students and, and the students who will watch this when we, when we, end, when we, when we archive? Just make, just make sure to um, pay it forward. That's all I say. You know, make sure that if you're going to give, if you're going to get, you have to give too. It's no good lurking in these social networks. If you're going to lurk, just forget it. You might as well just get your information from a, somewhere else. Just make sure that you, you're all creative, you all have great ideas, you all have great things to share, and just please do because the rest of us need your help. So, Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Bye, Joycey. Bye, Kath. Love See you. you. I hope. I love you too, honey. All right. Bye. Bye, everybody. Night. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thanks. Bye. OK, final thoughts before I end the broadcast and start archiving? Or archive. She's wonderful. You guys are so quiet. OK. So, um, any any other questions before I end the broadcast and or, and and create the archive? So we have an assignment this week to evaluate somebody else's. Yeah, and and that can work. absolutely go into next week. Okay. Um, it, you know, if you see something you want to, uh, this week it doesn't matter if everybody winds up doing the same thing. But I for the next time for the the lib guide, I'd like everybody to do. I'd like all of the assignments to be covered for the next one. So we're we're doing one of the that somebody posted else on the assignment live guide thing. Yeah, and use the same rubric that I'm using to evaluate with. Uh, but are we giving are we giving the evaluation to them or to you? Both, I hope. Okay. <laughs> it's you know, for this one. It, I think I said it was voluntary to give it to the other person. Mm -hmm. I, I you know I'd like I'd like you to get into the habit of evaluating technology prod products. I think you're probably already in the habit of it, but I'm I'm trying to model this. So um, see if you can get, it would be, I'm not checking you on this, but see, it would be nice if you gave your colleagues or, or classmates feedback. I'm going to require it next time that you share your feedback in 10.1 or 2 with, the, uh, with your classmates. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so I understand that 10.2 or 9.2 won't be immediately ready because you'll be waiting for people to post 10.1 um, or 9.1. If you want to, if you want to finish early, you can you can evaluate some of the earlier products. If you want to help somebody out, you can post your product earlier. Let's see if we get it done early. I'm like, okay. There have been some lovely, lovely digital stories that I've seen already. So good work to those of you who have already posted. And uh, and look at some of the strategies people have used. There, there. I'm, I'm learning a lot from. Um, I'm learning about new uh, new strategies from um, people who are choosing things that I've never seen before. Actually, what was Caitlin? What was the product that you used? Uh, my brain shark. Mm -hmm. What is that? It's you put a power. I made a PowerPoint presentation, and then I uploaded it, and you add audio. Like mm -hmm. for my PowerPoint presentation, I um I did the big six. So I have a picture, an image, and I embedded um, using previews my like Adobe. I edited it in text, and I made that a background, and then I put it into my Brain Shark, and I added audio explaining what each part of the Big Six was, and used my image as um, like my story. Like I like my I did number five was you no number four is use of information and it was chocolate and I said about there's some good chocolate and there's some bad chocolate and you leave the bad chocolate in the box it's like using information so that's kinda how I did mine so it was really nice and like I went through and like I said I was long-winded I had Loren look at it and she goes well this is kinda long I'm like well hopefully I can edit I just went back redid over top of what I did and hit saved and all the links stay the same it just changes it so it's really nice a quick edit like Animoto I get frustrated is if you want to edit you have to make a copy and then if you miss another mistake you gotta make another copy and keep editing the same one over and over again so it's nice that you could edit without having to redo I came across it in the list metaphors thing. are lovely thank you uh -huh. Caitlin would there be a reason why I would choose to use Landshark instead of just using the audio on PowerPoint 
it's embeddable. So like I just oh, embedded cool. it into my um my libguide as the start page. So it's you can link it, you can embed it. So it gives you more flexibility that you don't have to have a viewer or well, you can do it in PowerPoint. I don't know if that will transfer over to like Slide Rocket or something. I just pick something new. I've used yeah. some other ones. Like, yeah, didn't your face there. also show in in my brain jerk? What? Didn't your face also show on the left side of that? If it did, I didn't realize it. So oh. <laughs> that was completely uh, unintentional. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so yeah, you might have. No, in, in some of them, you have the option of actually showing your face live. I try not to do that. But <laughs> this, this is off topic that we're talking about. But getting back to Kathy Schrock, does she still teach? No, she retired a couple of years ago. I could not imagine doing what she does and or doing what you do and still teach too. But um, <laughs> I couldn't. Yeah, I, I'm so wiped out. Uh, I have two presentations to write for Texas that I haven't written yet. And I'm learning, trying to learn how to two-step again. <laughs> and Shannon, Shannon's been texting me a couple of times because she's meeting me in Texas. I'm jealous of all the conference. I know presenting is crazy, but I'm like, no, I'm I, going to oh, conferences. they've been cut. My my conferences have been cut dramatically. That's one of the reasons I'm leaving. I'm like, I get if I get to go to one a year, I'm doing pretty good. Well, you're going to PSLA, yay. I'm going to PSLA, and I'm going to try for AASL. Since it's oh, you school. have to go to AASL. That's really important. It's every two years. I hope that some of you will go. So it, it does sound like Caitlin's going. Anybody else going? Connecticut, yay, Beth. Okay, good. Try to get there. It's really important. Those are your people. It's it's just school librarians. Um, most The workshops are really um, practical. And the uh, usually the keynoters are inspiring. I know a lot of the people on TLLMR are planning on going, and they're actually already trying to make a uh, plan a group meeting at some point so we can all uh, meet face to face. Meetups are good, excellent, good for you guys. You might want to get stickers, like if you had um, like green stickers or something that you can put on your badges, something like that. That'll work. Yeah, that'd be good. So anyway, I'm going to have to say goodnight pretty soon, like like in two minutes, because <laughs> I've got to start writing these speeches and I have to call Shannon. So um, any final thoughts before we say goodnight? Hey, if you want to try to research my new superintendent or what he wrote, it's Brian J. Miller. I have, I can't find, I, I know he wrote something. I know he's published, but I can't find what he wrote. So he so, is your superintendent right now, huh? Yeah. Brian, he's in, he he's working in North Allegheny School District now, which is in uh, it's in Butler County in Pennsylvania, and uh, or no, it's in Allegheny County. It's in Allegheny County in Pennsylvania, and then he's going to be our new superintendent. And I was so excited because I'm like, yeah, he's published, and I'll use all the databases and find out what he wrote, and I can't find it. So, oh darn! I mean, not to get to this right away, but I'll work on it. So that's that was going to be our bonus one last week, and then something happened, and I think I, I think my computer died on me or something. So, oh, okay. anybody wants a real challenge, see if you can figure that one out. <laughs> okay, because you have all this copious free time, you know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> all right, somebody's going to work on this besides me, okay. or not. <laughs> I'll work on it. All right, but anyway, I'm going to say good night. I'm going to end the broadcast and do the archive. Any final thoughts? Nope. nope. All right. Have a good night, everybody. You good too. Night. Thanks. See you in the forum. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye.